Part 1, Sentient Dream Alters In the movie Inception, the action between the characters occurred in a shared dream. One of the characters was different from the others, though. Maul, the deceased wife of the main character Cobb, entered into the dream through memories in Cobb's subconscious. Despite this, she displayed motives such as jealousy, and was even able to come up with intricate plans the way any of the real people in the shared dream would. She behaved as though she were a real person, even though she was a figment of the main character's subconscious. Could this behavior be based in reality? Or was Maul's human-like behavior merely the product of Hollywood screenwriters? A study conducted on lucid dreaming subjects by Professor Paul Foley, a German gestalt psychologist from the University of Frankfurt, suggests that this notion may be more than big screen fiction. In the study's experiments, lucid dreamers were told to ask dream characters to perform various complex tasks, such as drawing or writing, solving math problems, or finding rhyming words. In these experiments, the dream characters behaved as though they were rational beings, successfully carrying out these tasks as though through internal thought processes of their own. The conclusion of the study was that these dream characters had some sort of consciousness of their own, even if perhaps only temporarily individuated from the dreamer's own subconscious. Though certainly surprising, the results of this study on their own are not difficult to conceive. After all, patients suffering from dissociative identity disorder seem to create various alters within their own consciousness that behave as distinct individuals in their own right. Why do people think that I'm you? Answer me! Shit. Answer me, why do people think that I'm you? I think you know. No, I don't. Yes, you do. Why would anyone possibly confuse you with me? I, I, I don't know. You got it. No. Do not fuck with us! Say it. Because... Say it. Because we're the same person. That's right. We are the all singing, all dancing crap. I don't understand this. You were looking for a way to change your life. You could not do this on your own. All the ways you wish you could be, that's me. I look like you want to look. I fuck like you want to fuck. I am smart, I'm capable, and most importantly, I'm free in all the ways that you are not. Oh, no. Tyler's not here. Tyler went away. Tyler's gone. What? This is impossible. No. This is crazy. People do it every day. They talk to themselves, they see themselves as they'd like to be. They don't have the courage you have to just run with it. Naturally, you're still wrestling with it, so sometimes you're still you. We should do this again sometime. Other times, you imagine yourself watching me. If this is your first night at Fight Club, you have to fight. Little by little, you're just letting yourself become Tyler Durden. These conclusions seem to take on a life of their own, though, when our common assumptions regarding the fundamental nature of reality are changed. Scientific American contributor Dr. Bernardo Kastrup explored this in a recent article. Kastrup suggested that the existence of our own individual consciousnesses is the result of the cosmic scale equivalent of dissociative identity disorder. Motivating this idea is the view of idealism, wherein mind is fundamental and the universe is an internal conscious state of a cosmic mind. The reason our minds cannot access the rest of the universe, Kastrup argues, is that we are in effect much smaller dissociated alters of this cosmic mind. Chapter 2. Emergent Spacetime But where does Kastrup get this idea of a cosmic mind? Motivating this view are the last few decades of discoveries in experimental and theoretical physics. Many people naively think that the world is composed of tiny bits of matter, floating in an empty void and that everything else emerges out of that. However, this is not the picture that physics has been painting in recent years. The future, at least of this development, will be that we start actually with information. So information is going to be our starting point, uh, and space-time is not something that we start with. In 2007, tests of Leggett's inequality were conducted by a group of physicists in Vienna, Austria, to test for quantum non-realism. The results falsified realism within quantum mechanics establishing that quantum particles do not actually exist prior to measurement. More disturbingly still, the field of quantum gravity has been discovering of late that space-time itself 
does not appear to be fundamental, but rather emerges from a deeper layer of reality. As quantum gravity theorist Fotini Markopoulou notes, In quantum gravity, now, probably what's going on is what we're seeing is that the whole notion of space and time is probably not really fundamental. So, space... That, that sounds incredible. That space and time is not fundamental. Space and time seem, in an ordinary sense, to be the most fundamental thing. And everything else seems to happen in space and time as sort of the fixed background. Right, which is what makes this problem so exciting and so strange. In the quest for a theory of quantum gravity, the missing theory reconciling quantum mechanics with Einstein's theory of general relativity, this emergent nature of space-time has become far clearer and more certain. The key clue was the holographic principle, discovered in 1995 by Juan Maldacena. According to the holographic principle, the information on the surface of a black hole encodes everything inside of a black hole. And this appears to apply not only to black holes, but to the universe at large. I seem real enough, don't I? Well, yes. But surprising new clues are emerging that everything, you and I and even space itself, may actually be a kind of hologram. That is, everything we see and experience, everything we call our familiar three-dimensional reality, may be a projection of information that's stored on a thin, distant, two-dimensional surface sort of the way the information for this hologram is stored on this thin piece of plastic. When the holographic principle was applied to entangled information, it showed that quantum entanglement causes the space-time linking the separate locations of the mouths of a wormhole to emerge. Quantum entanglement is the phenomenon that mysteriously links two particles over vast distances. If two particles are joined together in the same quantum state, such that one cannot be described independently from the other, they are said to be entangled. Then if one entangled particle is affected, the other will also be affected instantly over vast distances, even though no signal passes between them. And if you come up with heads, they come up with heads. You come up with tails, they come up with tails. Heads, tails, it just goes back and forth, and yet they're the same answer on both sides. And again, there's no mechanism, there's no reason they would be. They've, the scientists have gone through the different possible tricks like, for instance, are they double-sided coins? Are they trick coins? And they've kind of done experiments to rule that out. Is there some kind of surreptitious radio signal passing between them to rule that out? Is there some kind of predetermination? I mean, they've really gone through all the options, and yet they can't explain why these coins land on the same side. This linking of locations in space by means of entangled quantum information gave rise to a further realization. In quantum mechanics, particles have no defined properties prior to measurement, and this includes their locations. The locations of the entangled particles, therefore, literally emerge upon measurement from the entangled information itself. Except as any middle school geometry student knows, space is defined by locations. Without locations, you do not have space. Thus, if entanglement is what determines the relative positions of locations, space literally arises out of quantum entanglement. Thus, the reason entangled particles can affect each other over vast distances is because they are not within space at all. Rather, they link to each other beneath space in a deeper non-spatial layer of reality. But now I think the progress of science and of understanding of the nature of space and time have taken us to a possible explanation. So if you think of those two coins, they're on opposite sides of the universe or the continent or wherever they may be, but they act as though they're right next to one another. They act as though they're kind of nuzzled up together. So they, they, they don't seem to have any distance between them. They're acting as though there's no distance between them, although in, you go measure the distance, it's enormous. So the proposition is that the distance between them is somehow an illusion. It's somehow a kind of a mirage, or maybe a better way of putting it, it's a construction. That those, there's, those particles or those coins in the metaphor are rooted in a layer of reality where the distance doesn't seem to exist. Upside down. What'd she say? Upside down. What? Upside down. When Elle showed us where Will was, she flipped the board over. Remember? Upside down. Dark. Empty. 
Do you understand what he's talking about? No. Guys, come on, just think about it. When Al took us to find Will, she took us to his house, right? Yeah, and he wasn't there. But what if he was there? What if we just couldn't see him? What if he was on the other side? What if this is Hawkins and this is where Will is, the upside down? Like the Veil of Shadows. The Veil of Shadows is a dimension that is a dark reflection or echo of our world. It is a place of decay and death. A plane out of phase, a place of monsters. It is right next to you and you don't even see it. Physicists refer to this as Hilbert space. Hilbert space is not an actual space as we conceive of it with location and dimension, but rather is a mathematical description of the domain of reality in which quantum states exist as probability waves described by the wave function in the Schrodinger equation. What we see as physical reality, then, of space, time, matter, and energy, is not fundamentally real, but rather is a sort of illusion emerging from this deeper layer of reality of quantum informational processes. Whereas space is just obviously not fundamental. <laughs> space is something where when you, when you go from classical mechanics to quantum mechanics, space more or less disappears. You know, in classical mechanics, what do you have? Some particles moving through space with some velocity. In quantum mechanics, you have a wave function of all those particles. And that wave function, we tend to talk a language that the wave function is a function of all the particles and their locations in space, but we don't have to talk that language. We can use what is called the momentum space description. We can completely describe the particles by how fast they're moving instead of where they are in the universe. And for that matter, we don't need to use any description at all. We can just use these quantum mechanical states in their own right with no reference to space whatsoever. Corroborating this, computer scientist Brian Whitworth compared the seemingly counterintuitive features seen in modern physics with the information processing effects observed in virtual realities in video games. What he discovered was that 11 features of modern physics better match the virtual reality hypothesis than the notion that we live in a real material world. In some cases, such as with the phenomenon of quantum tunneling, the similarities were strikingly exact and disturbingly familiar. Basically, if you leave a marble in a cup in Second Life, and you leave all night, and you come back, what happens? The marble's gone. And it actually turns out that that problem isn't fixable. If you don't want that little marble to leave the cup that it's in, you actually would have to have an infinite amount of computing power uh, to guarantee that it won't over a certain amount of time. Everybody sort of see where I'm going with this? So what was just incredibly interesting to me, and I was already very interested in virtual worlds, was this bizarre fact that the computational limits imposed by simulation when you were doing, when you were simulating a virtual world on a computer, essentially resulted in the same kind of, I'm just going to say, uh, artifacts or problems that make quantum mechanics weird. Chapter 3, Quantum Cognition. The current consensus in physics is that spacetime is emergent from an underlying spaceless, timeless quantum realm. The best evidence we have points to the conclusion that our physical reality is not fundamental at all, but derives from quantum information in the wave function. This is only half of a larger picture, however, with much more far-reaching implications. Curiously, the same exact mathematics describing the behavior of quantum states in the wave function has been found to also match the behavior of conscious thought processes in the brain. The field of quantum cognition first arose from the accidental discovery that stock market behavior could be modeled using quantum mathematics. But what is the stock market fundamentally? Nothing more than individual human traders making individual choices to buy or sell. This led researchers to the realization that human decision-making in general could be accurately described by the Schrodinger equation, and thus the field of quantum cognition was born. A perfect example of this is picking ice cream from the freezer. Your favorite flavor is vanilla, but your second favorite is pistachio. What do you choose? If your brain operates like a classical computer, as some have thought, you would robotically compute the desired flavor, pull it out, and shut the freezer door. But this is not our common experience. 
Instead, we waffle between the two for a few seconds before making up our minds as to picking only one or the other. This sort of fuzzy logic mirrors the behavior of a quantum state in superposition, rather than that of a classical computer. And this similarity is more than superficial. A study published in 2009 by Diederik Ayertz noted that our cognitive behavior can be readily modeled using the mathematical formalism of quantum mechanics. This poses a problem if the brain is seen as purely classical, however. Classical simulations of quantum superpositioning behavior quickly lead to the Feynman Universal Simulator, or qubit, unpacking problem. A quantum bit, or qubit, is a superposition of many states, whereas a classical bit is comprised of only a single state at one time. Thus, for the classical system to simulate a quantum system, all the states in the qubits would need to be unpacked into individual classical bits, and this would lead to an exponential slowdown in processing and exponential requirements for information storage. If a classical system would try to simulate a, a quantum system, you'd have exponential slowdown, as, as Feynman showed. It, it, it would be, you wouldn't be able to do it. It would involve so much computation. What would be the point of using a classical system in the brain to, to simulate a quantum system if you could have the quantum system? Thus, if our conscious thought processes behave as though they were quantum, they must actually be quantum. This was a problem until recent years due to concerns that the warm, wet environment of the brain would lead to quantum states decohering before they could do any work. However, this concern was alleviated in recent years due to the advent of quantum biology, wherein quantum processes were discovered in all manner of large, warm, and wet living systems, from plant photosynthesis to bird migration. And in recent years, quantum biology has even begun to give rise to the field of quantum neuroscience. A recent study published by Matthew Fisher details the direct effect of quantum biology on the cognitive behavior of rats. Two groups of rats given lithium-6 and lithium-7 isotopes, respectively, demonstrated markedly different cognitive behaviors. The group given lithium-6 showed much stronger maternal instincts, such as nest building, than the group given lithium-7. So what this experiment did is it took uh, you know, something like 24 female rats, divided them into four groups, lithium-6 to one group, in that drinking water, uh, lithium-7, you know, naturally occurring lithium, which is essentially lithium-7, and the control rats for 10 days. Then they impregnated these 24 female rats, undoped males. I don't think it's important. But, um, and for during the 20-day gestation period, as the pups grew inside, they continued to feed them lithium-6, lithium-7, and the control rats. They gave birth to the pups, and what they were looking at and reported in this table is the uh, mothering behavior of the of the rats, and they were looking at things like nest building, nursing, grooming of pups, retrieval of pups when they take the pups away, how much of the mothers uh, grab the pups back, grooming of self, reaching for food, state of alertness, and so forth. Now, the control rats were average in everything. It's kind of amazing, huh? Are you suspicious? Is this blind, double blind, triple blind, or not blind at all? I don't know. It was done at the Cornell University Medical School, so, you know, it's a, uh, but let's look at the uh, naturally occurring lithium, which is essentially lithium-7 and the 99% lithium-7. Uh, so nest building absent, well that means something. Uh, nursing infrequent short duration, grooming of pups infrequent, retrieval of pups infrequent, grooming of self-absent. State of alertness low. Okay, well, so that's consistent with my own experience and experience of others that have taken lithium. If you take high doses, you are less alert. There's no question about it. So maybe this makes sense. Well, what about lithium-6? Okay, so lithium-6 is the normally 8%, but these rats were given the lithium-6 rats, 95% uh, uh, lithium-6, and the re results were just too unbelievable to, for me to believe. Uh, nest building was excessive, so they built a lot of nests. Nursing was very frequent and long duration. A retrieval of pups, I like this, excessive. Well, <laughs> you know, these were helicopter rats. You know, what can you say? They were, these were the safe pups, though. Um, okay, the one that really caught my attention was a state of alertness very high. However, given that they were given the same element with the same chemical properties, if the rat's cognitive behavior were only determined by simple electrochemical processes, this should not be. The only difference between lithium-6 and lithium-7 is a single neutron, which adds to the total mass of the isotope and thereby alters its quantum vibration frequency, and not its chemical behavior. Thus, the cognitive behavior driving the rat's maternal instincts was influenced not by chemical processes, but by a change in the quantum states of the lithium-6 they ingested. 
feed lithium-6 to some rats, lithium-7 to some rats, have some control rats, and look for any differences in behavior. Are there any behavioral manifestations uh, which might be uh, uh, present? It seemed like a completely crazy idea. How could there possibly be? Because the chemistry should basically be identical. The chemistry is determined by the number of electrons. Lithium-6 and lithium-7 have the same number of electrons, of course. How on earth could this possibly be that the two isotopes of lithium have an opposite effect on the sign of the mood of these uh, female rats? Well, okay, there's a mass ratio of seven to six, not so big, um, but what's remarkable is the nuclear spin entanglement time. I showed you this uh, 10 seconds. What well, turns out that for li that's for lithium seven. Lithium six is five minutes. I don't know about you, but my memory is much, not much longer than five minutes. And when I saw that, I was like, good Lord, could it really be that evolution had you know, undergone the uh, process where nuclear spins you know, became um, qubits in a quantum processing uh, in the brain and that our brains are some sort of quantum computer. Drawing from this clue, Fisher proposed that similar quantum biology in the human brain lies in the Posner molecule, the quantum spins of which can remain stable for hours at a time, even in the environment of the brain, long enough to correlate to normal synaptic activity. If this is the case, however, then our inner cognitive processes, our thoughts and feelings, lay outside of our ordinary space, existing as quantum states in the non-physical Hilbert space behind space-time. Curiously though, this also neatly matches a very ordinary intuition we have about our thoughts. If we stop to reflect on the nature of our thoughts for a moment, it is clear they are very real things, and yet they retain a platonic existence and do not occupy space or time. In both cases, the parallels match. On the one side, cognitive behavior and quantum states are described by the exact same mathematics. On the other, the platonic forms our minds access lie in a spaceless, timeless realm beyond physical reality. And yet, oddly enough, the Hilbert space behind physical reality is also spaceless and timeless. The parallels are too stark to be chalked up to mere coincidence. The most logical parsimonious conclusion matching both the evidence from the field of quantum cognition, as well as our own conscious experience, is that our thoughts and emotions simply are identical with quantum states lying outside of space and time. Chapter 4, Jung's Collective Unconscious. At this point, we appear to have two interesting pieces of data. First, our outer world of physical space-time emerges from entangled quantum states in Hilbert space. Second, our inner world of thoughts and emotions appear to exist as quantum states in that same Hilbert space. But where do we draw the line between conscious quantum states and non-conscious ones? Quantum states have a single nature defined by the Schrodinger equation. Thus, it makes no sense to draw up an arbitrary dividing line between them. Furthermore, two leading theories of consciousness, Giulio Tononi's Integrated Information Theory and Donald Hoffman's Conscious Realism, both describe conscious states as identical with entangled information. Now we can take it further. Look at entanglement. The red line and the green line. Let's look at the states of those. Let's call the state of the red line zero if it's close to you on the cube and let's call it one if it's far away. And the same thing for the green. And the question then is, how should we write the state of the red and green line together? What's the joint state of the red line and the green line on the cube that you're experiencing? Well, intuitively, you're gonna, you can see that whenever the red line is in front, the green line is behind, right? And whenever the green is in front, the red is behind. And that's because they're part of a whole, namely the whole cube. And because of that, they're entangled. And the right description for the state of the red line and the green line is the exact same equation that is the standard equation for entanglement. So this is, the top one is the conscious agent dynamics, long-term behavior. And then if you write down the, the wave equation for the free particle in quantum mechanics, it's exactly the same equation. Thus, the logical conclusion to draw is that it is all inner conscious states. However, if the inner consciousness of thoughts and emotions is identical with the entangled information in Hilbert space, and the outer world of physical space time emerges from this entangled information, then a remarkable conclusion appears. Space time emerges as an information construct from consciousness existing in a shared inner space. The very fabric of space and time is composed of more fundamental spaceless and timeless entities. I have a proposal. Go 
those spaceless and timeless entities that they're looking for are in fact conscious agents. And the stable dynamics of those conscious agents actually leads to the bits of Minkowski space that we need to piece together to get the unified theory we're looking for. Of course, we are not consciously aware of most of this collective inner space. As such, the rest of it would lie in our subconscious. Being a collective inner space, however, shared by all other conscious agents, this would quite literally be, from our perspective, a shared subconscious mind. The astute student of analytical psychology should recognize that this is of course identical with the collective unconscious of Carl Jung. Jung first recognized this phenomenon when he compared the dreams of his psychology patients from all over the world. Despite coming from vastly different cultural and national backgrounds, the same themes and motifs kept cropping up in their dreams, as if drawing from the same unconscious archetypes. A stark example of this was the story of the so-called Solar Fellows Man, which appeared in the dream of one of Jung's disturbed mental patients. Despite being crass and politically incorrect, this case provided an unusually stark example of the collective unconscious phenomenon at work. The dream contained a divine phallus hanging from the sun, spraying the earth below, and thus bringing life to the earth. Some months later, an ancient Mithraic text was discovered and translated, with the exact same symbolism and imagery. As the publishing of this text was rather obscure, it had not yet even occurred at the time of the dream. Jung was quite certain that his patient had never seen it before, but the identical imagery showed up in the patient's dream, and was far too similar to chalk up to mere coincidence. Jung's theory of a collective unconscious, however, explains this nicely. The same archetype exists in the collective unconscious, and simultaneously bled into both his patient's dream, as well as the minds of the ancient authors of the Mithraic text. Disturbingly, aspects of Jung's research into the collective unconscious seemed to mesh with Paul Foley's research mentioned earlier. In a series of his own dreams, an old man with kingfisher wings would appear with the name Philemon. Jung noted that Philemon seemed to behave as a separate being with a mind of his own. As Jung remarks, Philemon and other figures of my fantasies brought home to me the crucial insight that there are things in the psyche which I do not produce, but which produce themselves and have their own life. Philemon represented a force which was not myself. In my fantasies I held conversations with him, and he said things which I had not consciously thought, for I observed clearly that it was he who spoke, not I. Given the previous conclusion that our physical space-time is an emergent construct of a non-spatial collective inner mental space, Foley's conclusion regarding the apparent, independently individuated consciousnesses of dream agents disturbingly seems to take on a life of its own. If our own subconscious can individuate minds in lucid dreams, and if Jung's theory of a collective unconscious is correct, then what is to prevent some of these minds from individuating at the collective level rather than at the personal level? And if they do individuate below the level of our personal minds, attached to our brains, then what is to prevent them from existing in a completely autonomous fashion, lurking in the Hilbert space beneath space-time, long before we were born and long after our deaths? Well, superpowers. Did you see him? On Mirkwood? Do you know where he is? I don't understand. Hiding. Will is hiding? From the bad men? And from who? From our perspectives as minds limited to the putative quantum biological activity of brains, the distinction between the personal and collective unconscious is distinct. However, looking at it from a top-down view, a quantum cognitive Hilbert space from which space emerges would see everything as layers of consciousness all the way down. From this perspective, the distinction between personal and collective unconsciousnesses is completely arbitrary. 
However, if the line between personal and collective unconsciousnesses is ultimately not meaningful, and the subconscious individuates independently conscious agents, then it follows that some of these agents should be individuated at the collective unconscious rather than personal subconscious level as well. If they individuate at the personal level, there is no reason to believe that they should not also be individuating at the collective level. If they are though, then conscious agents of this nature should be existing independently of individual minds in this beneath space-time realm where we cannot see them. Chapter 5. Contacting the Upside Down If the line between the personal and collective levels of the unconscious blurs, then there would be no way to distinguish between Tholi's seemingly sentient dream agents and our hypothetical collective unconscious agents hiding in the shared inner space behind space-time. In fact, for all we know, they may sometimes be the same thing, but with no way to distinguish between them, the theorized existence of such agents would only amount to speculation. But is there really no way to distinguish between them? Might there be some way to directly access or interact with such agents after all? The connection between consciousness and entanglement explored before may provide us with a significant clue here. In quantum entanglement, two or more states are fused into a single indivisible state. If entanglement is equivalent to consciousness, as researchers such as Hoffman and Giannone suggest, then this indivisible state should have an associated subjective experience as well a subjective experience that binds together different elements in a similarly indivisible manner. And indeed it does. Consciousness possesses the property of binding, the linkage of subjective percepts into a single unified indivisible whole. For example, let me bring the word zebra to your mind. Undoubtedly, the auditory perception of this word in your consciousness is not the only thing that comes to mind. In fact, what likely comes to mind is an image of a horse with black and white stripes, or perhaps your latest visit to the zoo where you last saw such an animal. The term zebra and the image of a black and white striped horse are literally bound together, such that you cannot think of one without the other immediately springing into your consciousness in an indivisible fashion. If scientists like Hoffman are right, then the indivisible nature of entanglement would be the same as the binding of the word zebra to the image of a black and white striped horse, but from an objective third person rather than subjective first person perspective. The two concepts would literally be entangled by the putative quantum biology in your brain. This binding phenomenon occurs at other levels of the mind too, however. Subconscious levels of the mind, for example, beneath what we are consciously aware of, display this binding property too. In fact, this fact has been known about and used effectively in subliminal advertisement for generations. An illustrative example is the case of the subliminal marketing of Betty Crocker cake mix in the 1940s, which originally did not sell. Betty Crocker Foods had produced an instant cake mix. All you needed to do was add water to the supplied powder. In that time, this was considered somewhat of a miracle, of a minor miracle. The problem was that the miracle cake mix mixture did not sell. Undaunted, Betty, Betty Crocker Foods turned to the science of psychoanalysis. Crocker hired a Madison Avenue ad campaign firm to investigate through psychoanalytical techniques the underlying reasons that the housewives did not want the cake mix. And they did this through many interview sessions with many housewives. The conclusion, conclusion of the study was that although the average American housewife very much appreciated the convenience of the cake mix, she felt very guilty about deceiving her husband and family into thinking she had worked hard for them when in fact she had done very little work and put very little of herself and her own love into the project, as she had done when making a cake from scratch, entirely from scratch. So she was feeling guilt inwardly at having kind of gotten off 
a little bit easy, you're not having to do as much work or invest as much time and energy and love into the project of making a cake for her family. The answer offered to Betty Crocker by the psychologists they hired was quite simple. All that needed to be done was to add three words onto the instructions on the box of cake mix. Add one egg. Add one egg. Was that's it. They just had to say, you provide an egg to this mixture. Now, what's the egg? It's an archetype. It's a symbolic, original form. The egg is creative essence. In many ancient cultures, the egg represents the cosmos itself, the womb of creation, the sacred feminine essence from which all life springs. And again, it is this, the feminine fertility symbol, the egg, is what the woman contributes to the birthing process. The egg, being a subconscious symbol of the feminine, provided women with a way to assuage guilt that they were not giving to their families in using the cake mix. Here, the image of an egg is subconsciously bound to the concept of femininity. The giving of the egg, in turn, links subconsciously to a feeling of giving of themselves, the woman, to the making of the cake. After cleverly manipulating the subconscious mind in this fashion, sales of Betty Crocker cake mix went through the roof. The egg, as one of the most important and ancient archetypal symbols, holds very deep, often subconscious, correspondences to life, birth, and creation, making the entire process of making the cake more meaningful in the housewife's mind. In this way, she would, in proxy, be, quote, giving life to her husband and family by providing the egg. This is how the mind works at a subconscious level. Changing the recipe to add an egg to the mixture offered the guilty housewife a way out by doing more than adding just water, by adding an ingredient which was psychologically intertwined with her own life-giving and creative capabilities, she could assuage her guilt that she was feeling. The end result, sales of Betty Crocker's unwanted cake mix soared. As just illustrated, this phenomenon of binding extends into the subconscious. But what of the collective unconscious? Are the quantum cognitive states existing beyond space-time and Hoffman's model possibly influencing the subconscious from a collective level as well, as psychoanalyst Carl Jung believed? Here it is harder to tell. Once again, where does the personal subconscious end and the collective unconscious begin? Given the universality of the egg symbol representing the feminine in the Betty Crocker marketing case, perhaps this is already influencing the mind from the collective unconscious. But what if? Instead of entangling with another symbol or image in the collective unconscious, could symbols be used to entangle one's mind with one of Tholi's sentient agents living in the collective unconscious instead? If this were possible, how would we know? At this point, perhaps better questions should be asked instead. Is it possible that some already do know the answers to these questions, and have already been using this knowledge to use symbols to entangle with such collective unconscious agents? 
More disturbingly, is it possible that such activities have perhaps been going on all around us unnoticed, hiding as it were, in plain sight? It may be hard to say for certain. However, if something that walks like a duck and quacks like a duck has been walking and quacking in front of us this whole time, and if reality is constituted in the manner it appears to be, given our latest idealistic understanding of science, and if consciousness individuates minds in the manner Tholi's research suggests, then the probability of such agents already interacting in our world may be far higher than many are willing to admit or accept. Indeed, given the picture this evidence paints, there is no reason to suppose that this is not already the case. Man is a crazy boy who lives in me. And he says the things that I don't want to say. <laughs> he was born, a f you know, just a few months ago. I think he was born out of rage. He was conceived in rage. So he bashes everyone. He threatens to beat people and he's violent. It must be nice to have like an ignorant loudmouth who you can just sort of blame every... He wants to be blamed. I don't want to blame him. I, I, I ask him to leave. But he can't. He's here for a reason. People have brought him out. People conjured him up. Now he won't leave. You let us in. And now you are going to have to let us stay. David, where are you going? David! This video is brought to you by Betty Crocker Cake Mix, because unlike with other cake mixes, with Betty Crocker Cake Mix, you add the egg yourself. When you make a cake from a mix, which do you want? A fresh egg cake or a cake made with dried eggs? A higher, lighter, tastier cake? Why, fresh eggs, of course. But remember, all cake mixes are not alike. Betty Crocker Cake Mixes are different. They call for your eggs, added by you at home. It's the only national cake mix brand that lets you add the eggs. There's a reason why there are no dried egg whites, no dried egg yolks in Betty Crocker cake mixes. When you add the eggs, you're sure to get finer cakes most consistently. Nine out of ten homemakers in recent tests said Betty Crocker cake mixes gave them bigger, taller cakes than the dried egg cake mixes they tested. Yes, and better tasting cakes, too. Try Betty Crocker party cake mix for yellow, white, or spice cakes. And try Betty Crocker Chocolate Devil's Food Cake Mix for rich, moist devil's food with genuine fresh egg goodness. Get Betty Crocker Cake Mixes today. If you like this video, subscribe and support me on Patreon. And don't forget to check out the books in my Alaris novel series, Alaris, The Lances of Light, and Alaris, The Pearl of Heaven, on Amazon Kindle in the description below. You can find us on Facebook as well, at Idealism and Science versus Atheism.